Hi everyone, I'm Maurice Samuels, the director of the Yale Program for the Study of Antisemitism. And on behalf of YPSA and the Whitney Humanities Center, it's my great pleasure to welcome you to the first event of our Benjamin and Barbara Zucker webinar lecture series this year, which will be devoted to exploring the relationship of antisemitism to anti-blackness and other forms of prejudice. We have a superb lineup of speakers planned who will guide us in a conversation about the challenges that Jews, Blacks, Asians, Muslims, and other minorities face in common and about the differences that divide us. Please make sure to sign up for our mailing list on the website for the Yale Program for the Study of Antisemitism so you receive our webinar invitations and feel free to publicize these far and wide. Just a few words before we get started about how the event today will work. Our speakers will talk for about 30 minutes, at which point they will start taking questions from the audience. Please submit your questions anytime during the presentation using the Q&A function at the bottom of your screen. They will only be visible to me and I will submit them to speakers. The chat function is disabled. The audience uh, will also remain muted throughout the event uh, and we'll, we'll finish uh, around 6 p.m. So it's my great pleasure to introduce uh, today's speakers. Uh, first, Anthony Russell, um, here he is, is a vocalist, composer, and arranger specializing in music in the Yiddish language. This work has brought him to Los Angeles, Philadelphia, Boston, Miami, New York, Toronto, Montreal, London, Berlin, Copenhagen, Warsaw, Krakow, Tel Aviv, Symphony Space in New York City, and the Kennedy Center in Washington, DC. Anthony's work with the Klezmer trio Varetsky Pass resulted in Convergence, an EP exploring a century of African-American and Ashkenazi Jewish music. Anthony lives in Massachusetts with his husband, Rabbi Michael Rothbaum. Uh, next, we have Jeff Melnick. Here's Jeff. Uh, Jeff teaches American Studies at the University of Massachusetts, Boston, where he spends a fairly large percentage of his time these days on his work as a member of the Faculty Staff Union Executive Committee. In his scholarly life, he has written a number of books, including two in the arena of Black Jewish relations, A Right to Sing the Blues, African Americans, Jews, and popular, American Popular Song, and Black Jewish Relations on Trial, Leo Frank and Jim Conley in the New South. Most recently, he published Creepy Crawling with the Manson Family, a cultural history of the legacies of Manson and his followers. At present, Jeff is researching a book on race and youth culture in Boston in the years following public school integration in the 1970s. I'm extremely grateful to both Anthony and Jeff for helping us launch our series. And the title of their discussion today is Shifting Affinities, Cultural Investigation of the Black Jewish Relations Paradigm. So I will now hand it over to Jeff and Anthony. Um, first, I think I'd like to establish my own observations of certain underlying dynamics of the American Black Jewish Relations Paradigm namely a uh, cultural rhetoric of trans-historical connection that imbues so many discussions of the relationship between Black and Jewish populations in American space. I feel like it's an underexamined historical circumstance that specifically two disparate diasporas happened to meet on American soil. And of course, not just the diasporas, but the general rhetorical baggage each of those diasporic identities entail concerning loss of homeland, peoplehood, prophetic narratives, concepts of redemption and freedom, and the like. With specifically biblical cultural rhetoric, as far as Black people are concerned, I've encountered certain Jewish interlocutors who call this phenomenon an appropriation, which I think uh, is a misguided term in this case, as Jewish texts and narrative tropes were originally imposed on enslaved Black people under duress as a part of the hegemonic dictates of colonial Christianity. I do feel that it is very much in keeping with the general ways of being black in the world, that something that was imposed on black people as an establishment of order was summarily turned into an article of self-determination and freedom, but that's a whole other conversation for another day. Coming from the Jewish side, 
In the Magid section of the Passover Haggadah is the following statement. Whoever expounds on the story of the Exodus at length is worthy of praise. So there is, of course, a halachic dimension to this statement. The mitzvah is not merely in knowing about the Exodus, but also in speaking about it and expounding upon that narrative. So I'd like to make the contention that perhaps when Jews encountered the phenomenon of formerly enslaved people in the United States, culturally, rhetorically, there was this quality of Black people as living expositions of the Exodus narrative. Because of that, Black people have become a site of Jewish projection, identification, and even perhaps naturalization of historical Jewish suffering on the American soil. Rhetorically, Black people almost exist as an atavistic enactor of nascent peoplehood after the ravages of systemic oppression, a narrative most famously sketched out, of course, in the Exodus narrative itself. I think this is partly why facile and reductive comparisons of the respective socioeconomic trajectories of Black and Jewish people are invoked, oftentimes by Jewish critics, because there's this pre-existing notion that somehow these two groups of people are somehow intrinsically related, even when their respective outcomes are diametrically opposed. This is spelled out much more explicitly, I think, when we look at the history of Black cultural expression and genre consumed and eventually produced as extensions of Jewish expression as a sort of cultural rhetorical space of establishing both Jewish connection and very importantly, Jewish distance from Black people in American social and cultural space. Um, and I'm very lucky to be talking to Jeffrey because this is something about which he has written about quite ably. Amazing. So I'll, I'll jump in there. Um, and uh, first of all, thank Anthony for, for being the, the one to kick this off. Uh, thank uh, uh, everyone at Yale who organized this and uh, thank all of you who, are, who we can't see but are so grateful um, are, are joining us for this conversation. So, you know, this is like, um, uh, probably a, a kind of standard move to make, but but one of the things I always try to do when I talk about um, Black Jewish relations is sort of start. And Anthony's already begun this conversation. Um, open up this question about um, what we mean when we use that phrase. Um, and something I tried to do early in my career is replace the phrase <laughs> with a different phrase, which of course couldn't possibly work. The different phrase I wanted to introduce was Black Jewish relatedness as opposed to black Jewish relations, because there's a conflation that happened. And Anthony, as I said, Anthony's already begun um, to lay this out for you. There's a conflation that happens um, between two very different things. One is actual interactions between black people and Jewish people. And then of course we have to confront the fact that we, there are black Jewish people. Um, so there's the actual meetings between black people and Jewish people in the United States in this overdetermined way that, that Anthony um, has already limbed for you. And then there's the, the kind of um, cultural imaginary, the, all the work we do to um, construct the idea that somehow black people and Jewish people share some really consequential similarities. Now, let me just start with black Jewish relations because that's a phrase that I think most of the people who are on this call probably are familiar with. You wouldn't come to a talk like this if you didn't know that black Jewish relations is a thing um, and has some weight in American cultural history and political history and economic history, legal history. But it wasn't always a thing with that name. And so one of the things I want to do is sort of is just kind of unpack that name a little bit, black Jewish relations, um, because my sense is that we don't really have that as a common phrase of, as a way of talking about these actual um, interactions until the 1950s or 1960s. I mean, it gets going in the 1950s, but it really takes off in the 1960s. And one of the interesting things to note is that it takes off because there's a sense that develops, particularly among certain well-placed Jewish people, that the relationship is falling apart. So there's a number of things that happen in the 1960s, and I, and I won't, you know, I don't want to like create a whole archive of this now in the limited time we have together, but I'll say a few obvious things. Um, there's um, a, a, a sort of clear recognition that the kinds of alliances that brought African Americans and Jews um, together in the world of popular culture, in the world uh, of uh, um, 
uh, jurisprudence, legal work, um, those things weren't happening with the depth and the rapidity and, and, and the constancy um, that they had happened in, that, as had happened in the 1930s and 40s, early 1950s. So there's, this, there's a few crises that happen um, in the 1960s. I'll just um, locate one for now, the Ocean Hill-Brownsville um, school crisis of the 1960s, where black parents are trying to gain control of their local schools. And the, the teachers union, and I can't believe I'm about to say something critical um, of the teachers union now that Maury um, introduced me as centering my own teachers union as, as crucial um, uh, to my, my work in the world right now. But the teachers union, which was um, had a Jewish leader and a very um, uh, uh, a large population of Jewish teachers really resisted this because this felt like an incursion um, on their professional control of the schools. And, they, and it got ugly in a number of different ways. And I don't want to go into all the details of that, but one of the things that grew out of that event and a number of other moments of that kind of direct conflict were symposia and lectures and books and editorials and hand-wringing. I mean, more than anything, hand-wringing. Um, and, and, and just about every one of these symposiums, symposia and lectures was called something like what went wrong, right? It always had that, that kind of logic of inevitability built into it, right? That the relationship between African Americans and Jews was somehow natural. So that brings me to the relatedness part because the naturalness was not necessarily baked into the actual interactions. The naturalness was baked into this sense of and again, I'm, I'm returning to Anthony's initial comments here, the naturalness is built into this sense that somehow blacks and Jews are deeply similar to each other. And it, and it, it has its roots, obviously, in this 19th century African-American adoption of certain sacred Jewish texts, but it also has 20th century um, iterations, right? It has the sense that African-Americans and Jews um, are the most musical people. Uh, in the United States, that African Americans and Jews are the most likely, uh, the most likely groups to be fighting for social justice in the United States. So this thing that, that I'm calling the cultural imaginary developed, which tells us that more than any other non-white groups, and I'm using that, that word non-white really advisedly now, and, and in a contingent way, and only really up until the early 1930s, um, the sense that, that African Americans and Jews are the two non-white groups sort of most likely to find each other and work together, whether it's in the music industry or uh, the civil rights uh, movement, um, uh, creates sort of on top of it this superstructure um, of, of relatedness, right? And, and so I really tried to push this idea that there's a relatedness that's different from the actual relations. Now, the problem, um, and, and I'm going to stop after, for now, uh, I'm going to stop after I say this. One last thing is that it comes, there comes a moment where the relations break down enough um, that the relatedness comes into question as well. Um, and I'll, I'll timestamp that sometime late 1960s, early 1970s. And um, we'll say that there's this other thing that happens that we'll need to talk about, which is that up until the 1950s, African Americans and Jews tended to live really close to each other. Um, I'm sitting here in Boston, so I'm thinking about Roxbury, Mattapan. Um, I know a lot of you are sitting um, in New Haven, so if you think about, about the closeness of, um, let me see if I get this right, I'm trying to remember, Westville to New Hallville, um, neighborhoods in New Haven, which are, you know, largely Jewish, largely African-American. Um, if you think about New York, you know, think about Harlem uh, and the succession of African-Americans um, coming after Jews. Um, and, and there is this, this very sort of everyday um, contact that African American Jews have, which kind of supports this idea of relatedness. But that, that really begins to end in the 1950s as um, Jews take part in what we have to call white flight. Um, and Jew, Jews who are living um, in urban areas like Roxbury and like Harlem, um, uh, uh, and, and you know, sort of pick your neighborhood in, in the city that you're interested in, um, they're not there anymore. They leave traces behind because they still are involved in businesses um, in those places, and that makes things even more complicated, that the Jewish presence in a lot of that neighborhood is now simply as um, merchants or as landlords, um, uh, uh, and, and, and that makes it really complicated to, to imagine that Africans and American, African Americans and Jews are simply together, the same alike. So I'm going to step back there and see if Anthony wants to jump back in. Muted again. It looks like they're unmuting us one at a time. Yeah, but yeah. Got it. So this concept of um, an inherent relatedness becomes endlessly complicated and problematic when one examines how much agency Black people have had in this rhetorical relationship 
and how much material good this relationship has actually rendered them, um, it becomes really problematic when one considers how these narratives of connection so easily become a platform for concrete and established recrimination whenever Black people fall outside of the invisible boundaries of what is supposed to be a familial connection. The pain and the feelings of betrayal that arise in the hearts of Jewish observers of patterns of anti-Semitic thinking in parts of the Black community, I think these feelings of betrayal are familial, actually, in nature. How can you, a version of myself, indulge in thinking that potentially undermines yourself, rather uh, you as a version of myself? And I think this unusual kind of I think you said uh, cultural imaginary sort of relationship um, imbues a lot of the rhetoric that the monolithic Jewish community has in relationship to the monolithic Black community, but not always vice versa. I'm willing to bet Jeffrey is probably trying to unmute himself at the yeah. moment. Yeah, um, I don't, um, and I don't want to put anyone on the spot here, but if there's any, since we're going to try to actually have a conversation here, if there's any chance we can both be um, on the mic at the same time, it looks like maybe we are now, um, that'd be great. Thank you so much. Um, so yeah, to, to, I, I want to um, sort of pick up on, on the last thing Anthony said and, and run with it a little bit. Um, this idea, and it, it brings us obviously to the um, title of this, this seminar and um, the purpose of our visit today, that this idea that there's a very particular kind um, of black anti-Semitism um, is, is a question that I think Anthony and I both, you know, sort of wrestle with in, in uh, our conversations, our thinking about this. And, and I think he, he, he said something really important. I just want to unders underscore it and maybe extend it a little bit. Um, the idea that if there's any black disagreement or black distance from a Jewish organization or a Jewish movement or a Jewish production, um, that that's seen as a kind of betrayal and not just distance, disinterest, um, um, sort of, you know, um, uh, uh, agency is the word Anthony used, and, and, and that seems perfect. And so there is this problem with, with Black Jewish relations as it's usually constituted, um, which is, and this is really tricky to talk about. I'm, I want to paraphrase something Adolf Reed wrote in his book. Um, about Jesse Jackson, because Jesse Jackson, of course, is one of those those kinds of African Americans who, when he did something that was um, construed, and I, I don't like, I don't necessarily want to relitigate that whole case, but like when he when he said Heimie Town, and he, and and there was this question about whether Jesse Jackson uh, was anti-Semitic. Um, there was this went on, this conversation went on for years, and the question that some Jews finally got to was. Does it really show the fact that he even knows the word Jaime as a slur of Jews? Does it show that somehow he really is family, that he is in close, right? Because that, right? And so one of the things Adolf Reed underscored in his book about Jesse Jackson in one chapter where he was talking about the, the sort of black anti Semitism question is that one of the problems with black Jewish relations is that very often it's a conversation that white Jewish people want to steer from both sides. Right? They want to say their piece, but they also on some level want to ventriloquize what African Americans should be saying and doing, right? There's the agency question again. And so I'm really, it's really uncomfortable to talk about because it, it does play into some, it does play into some bad, the, the analysis of this plays into some bad old anti-Semitic images of Jews as white Jews as puppet masters, you know, sort of controlling the discourse, um, the Svengali, you know, um, kind, kind of construct. But it's a really important question to ask, right? Because one of the things that in black Jewish relations we, we always talk about is that Jews were there for African-Americans. They were there at the founding of the NAACP. They were there on the legal team um, uh, in the Brown versus Board of Ed uh, discussion. They were there obviously um, in, in the, um, uh, uh, you know, in, in the um, uh, enrolling voters drive in Mississippi in 1964, right? These, these are sacred texts of, of black Jewish relations. Um, and, and one of the problems with the way we talk about that whole history is that it becomes impossible to figure out where sort of the Jewish contribution begins and ends because it, it becomes sort of like the, the it becomes the water. Yeah. It's a, it's a communal property. It becomes right. a communal property. Perfect. Yeah. Yeah. And it's, it's a problematic communal property because what it does is it conflates the actions of 
a statistically small amount of very brave individuals who decided to actually move against the tide of where um, American, the American Jewish community was socially and right. to show up on behalf of, of black people for uh, the purpose of, of racial equality. And what has happened, of course, in intervening years is that their actions have been conflated with the entire J American Jewish community. Right. And what that has created is a rhetoric of indebtedness mm -hmm. that Black people have in relationship to the Jewish community. And I think it's really important for me to say and for people to hear that this is an unfortunate platform on which to build any sort of solidarity around mm -hmm. issues of anti-Semitism and acting on anti-Blackness. Uh, right. Black people in the United States already have and continue to have a very unfortunate experience with uh, rhetorics of indebtedness. Mm. You'll see this crop up in any number of spaces where people have decided that actually it was a good thing that entire populations of Africans were brought to the United States because um, pick your period, they found Jesus. That would be a very 19th century sort of version of that idea. Maybe later uh, they become acquainted with Western society and culture to their benefit. Um, you could go on Twitter right now and find somebody who's probably saying something to this degree. If you hadn't come to the United States, you would be in Ethiopia and you'd be starving or you would be a child soldier. Right. Given that um, so much of the rhetoric around black people in the United States has come from a place of indebtedness, uh -huh. uh, a rhetorics and a politics of indebtedness in relationship to a response to anti-Semitism is undermining uh -huh. and is not sustainable and does not build the kind of solidarity that is needed to uh -huh. address patterns of anti-Semitic thinking uh -huh. in uh, the black community, if I could talk about a community in a complete monolith right. in the way that one almost has to in mm -hmm. these kinds of conversations. Right, that's brilliant, yeah. I mean, the, just the, the, the very familiarity we have with the phrase black anti-Semitism. You know, James Baldwin decades ago, 50 years ago, um, was, was trying to remind us that, that, you know, if black people are anti-Semitic, it's because they're anti-white. And that's something like a lot of Jews don't like to hear, right, because it, it, it upsets a certain Jewish narrative of, of marginalization of kind of special um, kind of community place that's not 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 purely white. But that indebtedness is a real problem because it, it plunges us, all of us, into these situations where black people in this very ritual, narrow, ritualized, narrow way, where black people are, are sort of urged, you know, um, pushed, encouraged, pick your verb, um, to apologize for other black people, um, for bad black people. Um, and that's a really bad ritual that I think we really need to, to sort of think harder about, right? Um, and this comes up, you know, I've, I'm old enough that I, I feel like I can sort of track the cycles of every five years, some mainstream black leader has to disavow Louis Farrakhan. And it's like, you know, that's something we need to get past, right? Because Louis Farrakhan, really important, has a lot of followers, um, but he does, he's not at the heart of mainstream black experience in the United States. Good luck trying to make that case, though. Um, <laughs> I think, I think there are people in the American Jewish community who think we have pictures of Farrakhan on the wall like he's the Lubavitcher Rebbe. And it's just <laughs> not like, it's not like that. Um, I think there are spaces in the black community in which his leadership is looked on with a certain amount of dubiousness and derision. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Um, it's, I have a lot of problems with kind of, um, the formation and mobilization of a monolithic concept like black anti-Semitism, because I don't think it's helpful or particularly uh, effective uh, against fighting patterns of anti-Semitic thinking in parts of the black community. Um, establishing a phenomenon of anti-Semitism in ethnic terms gives it the dimensions of something that is intrinsic to that <laughs> ethnicity, as if right. each right. black person looks an innate anti-Semite who must be tamed, exercised. Right. Right. Um, right. 
the concept of black anti-Semitism makes anti-Semitism not into an idea or a prominent person or persons who is disseminating these ideas among the black community, but rather it turns uh, patterns of anti-Semitic thinking into an amorphous phenomenon, which while rhetorically useful, actually undermines the potential to address and dismantle patterns of anti-Semitic thinking. Um, black anti-Semitism is much more useful as a phrase and as a, a rhetorical device than it is as a way of actually fighting patterns of anti-Semitic thinking. That's right. That's right. And that, I mean, just for, you know, for our purposes today to try to sort of focus in on this thing we call black Jewish relations. I was, I was thinking back to moments in my own sort of scholarly life when, when there were these eruptions um, of, of, um, of, of, of mourning, of, of worry about black Jewish relations, about black anti-Semitism. And, and one of the major ones, and I'm sure many people on this call remember, were the Crown Heights riots of 1991, um, which again, without getting into the granular details of, brought into conflict Hasids and a black community in Brooklyn that was largely West Indian, right? And that came to stand for in this, you know, synecdochial way, I got that word right, for all of black Jewish relations, two very marginal communities for each group, right? West Indian, mostly immigrant population who came to stand for black people in the U.S. and Hasids who came to stand for Jews. Hasids have not been in the black Jewish relations game, you know, um, that we've been outlining for this history, right? Like they just get plunged into that narrative in that moment because they're sort of vis obviously visibly Jewish. Um, and that's something, you know, as a historian, I always want to try to bring to the table is say like, when we're talking about black Jewish relations, it, at least let us try to specify, and, and Anthony was trying to do that before when he was sort of reminding us that it's, it's a very small percentage, a particular kind of politically engaged Jewish people who have been involved in that main, you know, sort of historical activity uh, of civil rights work. It's a very small, um, uh, a group of Jewish people who um, were, you know, um, involved with the sort of, you know, the, the key legal cases of the night, you know, late 40s, early 50s. So, so that's the thing I want to remind us of is, is to sort of think about who we're trying to catch in this net when, when we cast this net called Black Jewish Relations. I, I'd like to bring up the fact that um, usually um, in evocations of the golden age of Black Jewish relations, of course, uh, Rabbi Abraham Joshua Heschel always makes um, a starring appearance. I've had the, the virtue and the pleasure of, of knowing his daughter, um, Susanna Heschel, who was an amazing scholar. And over Shabbos dinner, we were talking about this very subject and she said very directly that if you aren't doing the work of creating racial justice in this country, you don't get to name check her father, um, which means that a lot of rhetoric that has um, been created around this issue would instantaneously disappear because oftentimes um, this affinity that these two groups have for each other is often expressed in terms that are either approaching or have surpassed the half century mark, what do you do with an affinity when it's about two generations back? Right, that's a great question. That's a great question. Um, I just wanted to um, note, and I don't know um, if it's time or not that, it, that we're a little past 5.30 and I, I don't know if there's questions coming up um, in the chat yet because it's hard for me to see where they are. Um, and I know, I know that Anthony and I um, can keep going um, until, um, you know, somebody says end meeting. Um, but I also want to make sure that we're going to leave enough time for p other people to get in the conversation. Yeah, you, so. you guys can, uh, this is Maury talking, you guys can keep going for a little while longer and then I'll jump. Uh, okay. You'll keep jumping. Okay, great. Okay. Just wanted to check on that. Um, so, um, you know, one of, one of the things I'm, I'm going to, I, I want to put a, another term into the conversation that I feel like we've been dancing around, um, but haven't quite said, which is class. Um, and we're, we're not going to be able, able to have a forthright conversation about this thing called so-called black anti-Semitism or black Jew Jewish relations more generally without talking about the very different class trajectories um, of white Jews and African Americans in the United States, right? That, that um, maybe it goes without saying, um, but it's one of the things I was trying to index when I talked a little bit about white flight, um, which is this, 
this period and this formation um, that we call that we the, we try to capture with this name Black Jewish relations is really rooted in this time when um, American Jews were city people um, and were you know sort of work you know working class to lower middle class and we're in this moment now where the class differential um, between uh, white Jews and African Americans in the United States is so stark um, that it's almost impossible to to sort of have the conversation without at least noting that the two communities, it's more than two communities, obviously, but, but for the shorthand, two communities are, are living, literally living in very different places. Um, they're, they're occupying very different vocations. I know I'm painting with a very broad, in very broad strokes right now, um, but, but there is, an, and I feel like Anthony was, was sort of outlining this a little bit before, this idea that Blacks and Jews aren't so different from each other. Not only are they not so different, but there's this kind of like amazing cultural energy um, that, that convinces us that, that they're almost the same. Um, and that's really dangerous to my mind. Um, it makes it impossible um, for African Americans to kind of find good spaces in US culture as speaking subjects, um, telling their own stories and not telling a story that, that's kind of like, that we, always, that we know already, um, that's already been scripted. I think it's very easy to kind of want to, um, it's very easy for people to want to have a discussion about um, Jews in the United States and their relationship to assimilation into greater American culture. But I think what is not often discussed is that in order to do that, there was a pre-existing racial hierarchy that either had to be passively or actively accepted Mm -hmm. um, as almost a, the fair for kind mm -hmm. of arriving um, into full American assimilation and mm -hmm. uh, a lack of engagement with that, I think, as a community um, or really with that as an idea, once again, undermines the ability for these two communities, if I can speak about these two people in a, in a monolith, like we have to throughout this conversation, it undermines the ability for us to have a uh, historically honest conversation about where we have been and where we could possibly go as far as um, joining each other in the right. work of creating racial right. equality in this country. Right. Okay, I'm, I'm going to jump in here because we do have a, a bunch of uh, questions from people. And I would just ask, I noticed that some people have raised their hand, but um, since I can't call on people, if you could type your questions in the Q&A. Uh, so if you see that little Q&A button at the bottom, you can type questions there and I will ask the, the panelists. So we have a bunch of questions. This is really such a, a fascinating conversation and, and I think we're all just so grateful uh, to both of you for your you know, thoughtfulness uh, about these issues. So, one question that, that I had and that I see also that um, some of the um, uh, people in the audience have, have had is I think people were a little bit puzzled by something you said, Jeff, about how Jews weren't really white until the 1930s or maybe weren't seen as white. And we're wondering if you could just say something about um, how Jews became white. Did, did Black people ever not see Jews as white? Um, did, um, uh, you know, how do we parse this idea of Jews as almost white, but not quite white enough for white America? Mm -hmm. Yeah, great. I mean, that's, th thank you, anybody who's thinking about that and asking the question. Thank you, Maury, for putting it on the table. Um, you know, Jewish whiteness uh, is uh, a really complex historical question. Um, I've written about it. I see at least two other people on the call who have written uh, about it as I scroll down the way. And I'm sure more, um, some folks who maybe I don't know. Um, so this is something that historians really got interested in 1980s, 1990s, definitely earlier as well. And, and there's this sort of clear sense that at least up until the 1920s, Jews occupied some kind of middle space. Jews are not the only not sort of, sort of distinct group in the U.S. Um, we've got great historians of Italian American life, great historians of, um, uh, of uh, our, uh, you know, Armenian uh, American life who have, who have tried to parse this question. Now, what do we do about these groups that um, immigrated um, as part of the great wave uh, starting in the 1880s of what we you know, generally call the new immigration. Um, and we're not Anglo-American and Jews were clearly among that, Eastern European Jews um, in particular. The, the German Jews who came earlier, a little bit of a different story. But Eastern European Jews were, seen, were definitely seen as a distinct population. Up through the 20s, there was plenty of people, um, anthropologists, politicians, 
journalists, journalists who were still referring to Jews as a race, right? That's obviously like not an understanding that we have now of Jews. And the process by which Jews stop being publicly recognized as a race, it's obviously not overnight. We can't put a year on it. We can, you know, make a, we can put some frames around it, right? We can certainly say um, that by the 1930s, 1940s, as Jews are sort of moving up the economic ladder, certainly as news of the genocide um, in Europe starts making its way to the United States in the 1950s, it, it kind of helps frame this idea that Jews need to be sort of like, we need to underscore the safety of Jews in the United States. And part of the safety is understanding Jews um, as white people. And then really, I think with the suburbanization of the 1950s, um, it becomes impossible to think of Jews as anything other than um, just another, what, you know, what in the 1960s and 70s, we started more uh, frequently referring to as an ethnic group. Right. Um, and so Jews are like Italians or like Irish or like, you know, um, uh, various other hyphenated groups uh, that are clearly white. You know, this holds for immigrant groups up until basically 1965 when the immigration law changes. And there's a huge wave of people from Latin America, Asia, the Caribbean, Africa and so on, who are um, hyphenated Americans and clearly not not white in, in American terms. Mm -hmm. So that's a quick answer. I could go on. But yeah. Um, no, that's great. That's um uh, another question um, from someone is uh, how someone who, who grew up in the South and is, you know, wondering about whether uh, we can say the Jews in the South adopted uh, the prejudice of white non-Jewish Southerners. And so I think we can say, you know, where most Jews came from, they probably didn't have many opinions of black people at all. And so how did, can we trace a kind of history of anti-black prejudice among Jews. How would we tell that story? In the historical Good. record, you find many proofs of uh, a general amount of bafflement from um, the Southern Jewish community um, in the face of all of these Northerners who came over the course of, of Mississippi summer, um, because to a certain extent, they had already figured out um, in decades and centuries uh, previous, what their specific place was in the racial hierarchy of the American South. And they knew that that level of interaction with Black people put that in peril. So there is that. I mean, that is a part of the historical record is that all of these, you know, Jews from the North came and the Jews in the South were like, who are these people? What are they doing? What is this about? Mm -hmm. right. Right. And, and I should just say, actually, one of the people in the audience pointed out that, of course, um, you know, uh, white people or Jews have had the, the the, the privilege of choosing whether to be white in a, to a certain extent, you know, and whether to do that, which is an interesting. So here's another question from, from the audience. Um, what about the role of um, black Jews? Um, and this is something, maybe a question, um, Anthony. So, um, you know, we have, of course, you know, the kind of celebrity examples like Sammy Davis Jr., but also, you know, there may be more problematically like the, the black Israelite movement and, and things like that. How should we think about those groups? A question really for both of you. I think as far as black Israelites are concerned, it's, it's complicated because it in that case it really is I think quite directly an appropriation of um, Jewish religiosity as a form of uh, religious expression um, and I think there's a lot of different aspects of uh, black diasporic history that go into that sort of um, impulse to appropriate very directly um, this way of, of, of expressing oneself religiously. Um, it's very hard for me to actually figure out how that, that fits in. And it's something about which I am afraid I'm a little ignorant. It's something that I've been meaning to learn more about just because it's interesting in general, but I don't know. In a way, it seems like, um, a sort of fulfillment and embodiment of this idea of the paradigm, but it goes off into such a very definitive direction that I think um, in many ways, um, if they're not looked on 
um, with hostility, they're looked on with a great amount of curiosity um, as a bizarrety in relationship to the normative aspects of, of you know, American Judaism. Mm -hmm. Right, and, may, and I'll just throw in that obviously mainstream white Jews are not particularly interested in black Jews um, of any kind. Um, there's not like a, a huge community outreach uh, effort to bring, to open up conversations with the more fringe groups or to bring in, um, and that's part obviously of, of Jewish, Jew, you know, Jews not being like a converting um, uh, people, but, 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 you know, that's there too. I mean, there, there's, I, I just want to just quickly go back to the question about Jews in the South, since I have a particular interest there um, in an earlier era than, than what Anthony was talking about, um, which is that most of the Jews in the South um, in the pre-World War II era are German Jews. And they're to, use, to borrow a word that they wouldn't have used because um, it's a, a more Eastern European, uh, a Yinglish uh, kind of word. They were all right Nicks. I mean, they were really satisfied with their position by and large as quasi white people or apprentice white people. Um, and, and that's a really, that made for a really complicated map in, in, in moments of crisis when, um, you know, and obviously I wrote a book about the Leo Frank case. So that's a, a moment of real crisis where um, Jews make great efforts to try to demonstrate to the white people around them that they are really better than black people and really more trustworthy and safer and, and all that. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Of course, there's also the, the Israeli dimension to this question, which I don't think we want to get into today. But of course, oh, you know, you've gone to Israel and you see that there are a lot of, you know, um, Jews from Ethiopia there. And that obviously is a, is a whole other and so here's a question um, for Jeff uh, from Matt Jacobson, who's um, written a lot about these questions. And he wants to know, you know, how, he says that the idea of black anti-Semitism really controlled the space of the 1990s. Um, and, but here we are in this very different moment in 2020, uh, in a moment of kind of frank white nationalism. Mm -hmm. uh, and we really have no narrative to suture these moments together. Can you kind of maybe uh, try to do that or maybe narrate your own position in relation to these two moments as a scholar? That's great. I mean, I, I thank, thanks, Matt, for the question. Um, and I'd like to bring, you know, Anthony in on, on answering it too, because that's sort of like recent history that we're both trying to parse right now. Um, and there's the, still the sort of over familiarity. And as you were asking, I was trying to remember who the celebrity was who had to go through recently this ritual of apologizing. And he's teamed up with some rabbi who's teaching him how to really understand Jews. And I'm blanking on who it was now. You got it? It's Nick Cannon. Nick Cannon, of course. Right. And so we still have this ritual of you know, a black person saying something, and I don't remember what Nick Cannon said, and it was maybe awful, I don't remember. Um, but we still have this ritual of, of um, running the black anti-Semitism, you know, sort of cranking up the black anti-Semitism machine, and then the apologies, and the learning, and the triumphant redemption tour. Um, and it's, to me, I, I don't, I mean, I don't want to sort of lapse into the vernacular here in answering what's a very serious question, but it's not that we have not developed a phrase like evangelical anti-Semitism. Right or Christian Zionist, Christian Zionist anti-Semitism, right? Like that's real in our world right now. Not only is it real, but it's terrifyingly shaping of our national politics. I'm gonna go ahead. Also, I I think it's really interesting. Of course, I was thinking about kind of um, the the sort of history and trajectory of patterns of anti-Semitic thinking amongst the Black community, and I think what a lot of people don't often address is the fact that Black people in inherited uh, a millennia old uh, system of pre-existing uh, Christian anti-Semitic rhetoric, which many times is often present in the anti-Semitic thinking um, that is found in portions of, of the Black community. Uh -huh. So we don't, we don't call it Christian, we need to do something about Christian anti-Semitism. Um, but God forbid, should a black leader invoke the image of Judas, immediately yep. that right. is um, apportioned to his blackness, right. and not necessarily to his Christianity. Right, right. And I, let me throw one thing in that I, maybe I shouldn't, but I'm going to go ahead and do it anyway. Um, Israel looms really large in this contemporary conversation, just to get back to Matt's question. Um, uh, which is to say, you know, one of the breaking points, in, you know, in the Black Jewish relations narrative of the late 1960s is that many African Americans begin to see their position in the United States as having much more in common with Palestinians in the Middle East than with Jew white Jews in Israel. 
that's obviously a real problem for a lot of American Jews, right? Now, in our own moment, Christian Zionists, who very often are starkly anti-Semitic in some of the most traditional, terrible ways, they're Zionists, though, right? They support the state of Israel as a Jewish state. And so they're off the hook with a huge swath of American Jewry who still support the idea uh, of Israel as a, as a Jewish state. So, so the Israel question is really in this in some complicated ways and has been, you know, for, for black people in the United States as a kind of negative, you know, sort of check against them, right? Because there's this, this sense that develops in the late 60s, early 70s, that black people are, are anti-Israel, right? Um, and in our own moment, the, the proponents of the most dangerous anti-Semitism in the United States, bar none, are people who support Israel. Um, and so we're in this very complicated um, sort of religious, racial, political moment. Mm -hmm. Great. So a question about, you know, I would say that, um, you know, both uh, Blacks and Jews have this um, weight of a very difficult history looming over them. I mean, both feel that they were victims of, of unique forms of oppression, and rightly. So we have slavery on the one hand, and we have the Holocaust on the other. And I think, um, I'm wondering if you can say anything about um, this kind of almost like an implicit sense of competition among victims, um, and does that play into the difficulties of the Black Jewish paradigm? I think it's interesting that you um, expressed um, expressed is on the Jewish side it in terms of the Holocaust because I think for a lot of um, communal and familial narratives about the phenomenon of Jewish suffering, it often predates the Holocaust. Um, and knowing and naming um, the nature of that systemic oppression, usually by the Russian empire, is an important <laughs> part of formulating exactly what the narrative is that connects Black people and Jews. I believe yeah. you are talking about um, a phenomenon that is very colloquially called the Oppression Olympics. Olympics, absolutely. It's said on Twitter yeah. that we should get used to the Oppressive Olympics because it's going to be the only Olympics that are going to be happening for a long time. <laughs> I, I, Jeffrey, would you like to? Yeah, yeah, yeah. I mean, I'll jump in. I just happened to have this book sitting right near me, and I don't, I don't know if you can see. Um, uh, Tony Morrison's Beloved, which came out in 1987. And I don't know who on the call will remember this, but there was a huge, uh, well, it's a huge, but there was a, 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 a legible Jewish um, uh, uh, response, negative response to the book because of the epigraph. And I'll read it um, because it's short. Um, the, the, the first thing you, you read in the book that Tony Morrison wrote is 60 million and more. Mm -hmm. So simple, th you know, she's, Opening the book, she's clearly making this move to try to get our, our attention to the Middle Passage um, and putting a number on uh, the number of people who uh, perished as a result of the Middle Passage. And it's because she said 60, and you, ha you people will have to trust me on this if you haven't heard this before, um, there, was a, there was an outcry in certain corners of the Jewish community that she was trying to sort of outdo the 6 million mm -hmm. in a major scale. Right by saying the 60 million. And so this is like a real, this is a, a really structuring formation in black Jewish relations um, is that Jews always want to keep, certain Jews want to keep present. And I'll, I'll just say it because this is a particular political concern of mine. Um, that to me is the work in our own time of the Anti-Defamation League, right? Um, which is involved in a lot of business, but one of the main things they're involved with is keeping present this idea that Jews in the United States live always every day an incredibly fraught um, experience. And in, in doing so, they very often are put in the position of having to elbow out African-American claims to that same kind of status. Mm -hmm. um, okay, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to go there and I'm going to bring the, the discussion to what we were talking about right before we started and what I think is uh, tragically on a lot of people's minds right now, which is RBG. Um, and, you know, we're all, you know, experiencing that loss right now. And, but, you know, it's an interesting uh, thing, that very term RBG is, you know, arguably an appropriation or not even arguably an appropriation from African American culture. And I'm wondering if, um, I know that you two, I'm not really wondering, I, I know that you 
something to, to say about um, the way that um, we, she has been uh, lionized in our, in the culture right now is being, uh, and whether that, uh, what that is enabling and also maybe what that is um, repressing. Ever so briefly, I'd like to address the fact that um, giving the judge this moniker, this kind of cutesy moniker, um, as a sort of campaign of valorization is very indicative of the fact that there is a point in American history and contemporary history where um, valorization was decided was much more interesting and much more easy to do than civic action. Um, in a way, we could outsource the kind of civic action that we were supposed to be doing um, to these um, kind of elevated actors. Um, if I mean, Jeffrey's had kind of really interesting and very multi-layered things to say around the construction of a concept like the notorious RBG. Um, yeah, I'm happy, to I'm, I'm, happy to I'm happy to jump in at least briefly on that because I've been tangling um, with people on, on social media for a couple of days um, about this. I'm worried that I've lost my connection, so I'm going to try to reconnect. Okay, no, I got it. I'm okay. All right. Um, okay, so just to hit, to tell me in the chat box if you lose me and my internet connection is being a little weird. So the, the idea that you take this jurist, this short white Jewish woman and make a meme out of her and you know, put, put um, Christopher Wallace, notorious uh, B.I.G.'s crown on her. Um, I can't help but try to read it in, in, in the history uh, of the Jewish presence and minstrelsy. I'm not putting this on Ginsburg herself, obviously. I don't think she had much to do with her own memification, right? This is people around her. It was invented originally by a Jewish NYU law student who uh, then co-wrote the book, Notorious R R RBG, the, the children's book. Um, and so this is a Jewish, you know, it's a, it's a, it's a white Jewish production. Um, and it's, it's impossible for me not to see it as, as the humor, the sort of the putative humor in it as being in the distance between the brilliant, you know, white jurist and the street rapper from, from Brooklyn. Um, now there are, I just want to be fair, there's plenty of people who are saying like, no, it was honoring both of them. It was saying that in their fields, they were both, you know, tough talkers, you know, like, you know, you know, didn't give into the sort of conventional expectations and all that. But I'm a historian, you know, and I got to read it in history. And there is this legible history um, of Jewish people pretending to be black. Um, and it's a really important history. And it's, I mean, it's my whole first book. Obviously, I care about it. Um, the, this question of how Jews because exactly because of their closeness to black people claimed a special ability to write black music, to perform black music, to promote black music. And later on when Jews sort of stepped out of the central role to be, you know, the, the record label owners and the producers and so on. So there's like a history here that I think is impossible to ignore um, when we think about the notorious RGB. Um, the, the, the conversation I've been in has been fascinating um, and particularly interesting to see all the um, African American people who have jumped into the conversation to say, "Oh yeah, that's that that's that that everyone knows that's been bad for a long time." And I wasn't aware. Like I didn't. I I feel a little benighted because I wasn't aware that there was a whole conversation already about it. Mm -hmm. Okay. Um, so you know, a couple people have um, noted that you know, uh, or have wondered whether, um, you know, this, the black Jewish relations paradigm, is it only really something in the past? Or can we talk about um, moments or, or, or points of convergence today? You know, one of them being, for instance, that, that blacks and Jews are, you know, two of the most um, uh, loyal groups within the Democratic Party. In fact, their voting records are pretty similar, you know, for the, for the most part. Um, and, you know, to try, we only have a couple minutes left, so I think this is going to be the last question, but, um, you know, uh, is there, um, are there moments of, of kind of, you know, are there positive things that we might look towards today, politically useful ways of thinking about um, the Black Jewish uh, relationship, you know, uh, today? Ever so briefly. Without whitewashing what's, what's wrong about it, but yeah. Of course. Um, ever so briefly, I'd like to address the fact that the reason why we even have the ability to, to name check the people who did take the uh, effort to align themselves with nascent movements 
of racial equality is because they showed up in physical space. Mm. They did not show up in rhetorical space. They did not release a concept record about what they thought their relationship was to black people. They did not write an essay, even though as an essayist, uh, I think it's, it still is important work to do that, to get those ideas out into the world. They showed up in physical American space, an American space in which um, where they were supposed to be in order to retain the status quo was very distinctly written out. They crossed those boundaries. They crossed the imaginary boundaries of what the, Americ uh, the American Jewish black relation was supposed to be. And they entered into physical space and they showed up on behalf of black people. And I think as long as you are trying to do that to the best of your ability, you will find yourself um, answering this question uh -huh. directly in time and once again in American space. Great. I mean, it's, I, I have almost nothing to add um, to that other, other than, you know, if, if you can join your union. Um, you know, I'm just trying to think of like literal street level places where African Americans and Jews might still come in contact and the growing union movement particularly teachers unions, um, particularly trying to bring together, um, uh, cl you know, sort of um, main classroom teachers with para-professional teachers. There's going to be some like really interesting ways that I think Jews in particular will be challenged to imagine, as I, I think Anthony was just, just really um, hinting at, um, imagining solidarity with black people um, that, me that will mean Jews showing up for things that might not immediately benefit them. Um, but that, that might be kind of just larger social justice achievements that Jews care about um, or should care about. Yeah. Right. The civil rights movement originally was not an overdetermined phenomenon. People did right. not know how it was going to end. Right. Um, which makes the actions of Jews in that particular period who were a part of that movement even more uh, valorous in my mind, because yeah. this was once again, like a nascent movement. Um, there were not terms which were dictated to the people who were in this movement um, in order to assure that they were going to join this movement. Um, we really do have these models. And if we follow these models in space, if we show up, like I said, once again, we have answers to these questions. Mm -hmm. Okay, well, I think we have to leave it there. It's six o'clock. Uh, clearly, this conversation could go on a lot longer, and fortunately, it will, and I encourage everyone to tune in for our whole lecture series this semester, which, again, you can find on the YPSA uh, YPSA website. Um, and um, my apologies to the uh, people who asked questions that I didn't get to, to ask. Um, they were really fascinating questions, and I thank the audience. But uh, let's all give our special thanks to Jeff and Anthony. Um, on the, one of the downsides of the webinar format is that they can't hear you, but um, I will clap for everybody. So thank you very, very much um, uh, for this really, really stimulating conversation. So. Thank you so much for having us. Thank you, really. And thank you, everybody, for showing up. Great, great to see your names, at least. Really appreciate it. Okay. Thanks. Take care. <laughs>